So, you know, when it comes to perspectives on crime, this is something that's evolved really quite considerably. If we go back to England, for example, 14th to 17th century, you know, the attitude towards crime really was that criminals need to be punished very, very severely. Okay, there was a real, you know, burst for vengeance. And, you know, justice was pretty barbaric. Um, you know, the role of prisons was only to keep offenders until their punishment. Okay, we, we didn't have prisons like we have today, okay, in which, you know, prisoners are kept in prison for a considerable amount of time. They'd be kept there until their punishment, which would usually be some sort of torture, or it would be quite often um, death penalty. Okay, and the death penalty was really a spectacle, right? It was something that had an audience that drew in people from quite far away and was seen as a form of entertainment. Um, but also, there was no real set punishment for particular crimes. Okay, it wasn't the case that you know if you committed first degree murder, well, this is the typical punishment that goes with first degree murder. Okay. Instead, the judge would decide on a case by case basis what punishment seems fitting, okay, to the case. So obviously, with this massive amount of latitude, meant that their you know, prejudices, biases would you know, impact particular groups, but also bribery could go quite far, okay. So those from a higher social standing could buy themselves out of a particular punishment. <clears throat> so there was no equality, okay, there was no consistency in the sentencing, and obviously there was a great deal of corruption. <clears throat> but also, a kind of main takeaway point from attitudes at this time was, like I say, the real kind of first for vengeance, okay, and that people should really pay and pay quite harshly for the crimes that they've committed. And, you know, the punishments weren't, all, weren't always proportionate to the crime, okay. And that's something that we can consider, you know, throughout the course, because it's not like today there isn't still some first for vengeance in particular cases, okay. And we can think about why that might be and from an evolutionary perspective it's quite simple right from an evolutionary perspective if someone was you know doing harm and they were taking what was yours for example then one way to make sure they don't do it again is to punish them severely okay that way you're going to be able to protect your resources and ensure your survival and your survival of your offspring but of course evolution is solutions to problems of the past right and society moves quite far beyond that now so now we can you know, begin thinking about in the context of today's society, you know, are those instincts still relevant, okay? Hurting someone this severely, for example, for particular crimes, is that still going to act as a successful deterrent? Is that still going to lower crime rates? Is that still going to help, you know, protect individuals? And, you know, these are um, issues that we'll come back to, okay, throughout the course. <clears throat> And then there's a big change really in the 17th century, which is the emergence of the Enlightenment period, okay, in which there, you know, really begins this mindset that actually people are not ruled by the state, okay, it's not the case that their homes are um, ruled um, by the state, but in fact there's some sort of social contract, okay, between the citizens and the state, that some things are acceptable, some things are not, that some things are expected of each, okay. Um, and there's a number of other changes here that I'll go into in more detail on the next slide, um, but a, a change really in, in the view on punishments, okay, a uh, belief that uh, punishment should be uh, proportionate to the crime, the idea now emerging that, um, that prisons might be one way to go, that there's now the um, beginning of the um, critiques against the death penalty and torture and so on. Um, and then with the 19th century is really the beginning of people wanting to understand the question of why, okay, certainly at least in an empirical way, but trying to understand you know, what causes criminal behavior, why are some individuals different than others and what's leading some people down a criminal pathway. Um, one example of this is phrenology by Franz Galt, okay, who believed that differences in skull shape corresponded to differences in criminal types and between criminals and non-criminals, a theory that wasn't supported by evidence and was quite quickly discredited. And then, you know, the emergence of positivism was that these sorts of theories must have evidence to back them up, okay, the things must be empirically studied, okay, if these sorts of theories and claims are going to exist, then they have to actually be empirically researched and have evidence to support them. And then the establishment of criminology in the 
the field of trying to understand what causes criminal behavior. And one of the fathers of this is Lombroso, the Italian doctor, okay, who observed some physical differences between the criminals he was working on and non-criminals. And he believed that these markers of caring, as he called them, were evidence of an evolutionary throwback, okay, that criminals were lower than the rest of us on the evolutionary hierarchy. And more than that, his theory was very deterministic, right? It was that you know, these individuals were destined to be criminals, okay? There was nothing that could have been done about it. That's just the way that they were born. They were born to be bad. Um, and further, he believed that using these physical markers he identified, criminals could be identified before they had even acted in a way that was criminal, okay? Now, Lombroso was very popular during his life, but very quickly after his death, okay, became quite discredited. Some of the ideas that he was spouting weren't being backed up by evidence, but also some of his ideas were being really misused for political agendas. Um, and by about the 1920s, there's then, you know, the, the, the complete um, shift in viewpoint, okay, to an evolution, to an uh, environmental perspective, okay, as um, social learning theory is beginning to emerge and behaviorism is popular, and then after that, the development of attachment theory. Okay, so perspectives to do with the environment. Okay. And for a long time in the 20th century, at least according to psychologists, it was the view that criminal behavior is a result of environmental factors, not biological factors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and you know, Adrian Rain was really one of the first to challenge this in the mid-1990s. Um, and now, after a couple of decades of this sort of research, the kind of general agreement, I would say, amongst criminologists and forensic psychologists is that both nature and nurture play a part, okay, in um, contributing to criminal behavior, okay. We'll look at that more when we talk about um, genetics, but what we'll see is when we look at the heritability of antisocial personality disorder or violence or anything like this, usually about 50% of the variance is explained by genetics and the other 50% explained by the environments, okay. So overall, it's kind of a tie between nature and nurture. But obviously, in some cases, the environment will be more of a factor, okay, if we're talking about someone who's had a terrible upbringing, for example. And in some cases, biology will play more of a role, okay, if someone's had a pretty good whole life and it's not very obvious what may have led them down a criminal career pathway, that maybe there's, you know, a serotonin deficiency or some severe brain dysfunction that maybe makes them more sensation-seeking or impulsive or something that might lead them more to a kind of criminal lifestyle. Now, obviously, Lombroso was long, uh, wrong in a lot of his ideas. None of these are determining factors. Okay, it's not the case that one is determined to be a criminal based upon these factors. They're more predisposing factors. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, so when I mentioned the Enlightenment period, um, one particularly influential text was um, Crimes and Punishment, 1764. And these are just some of the key points that were made uh, in this paper. So, you know, laws should be actually available to citizens. They should be clear, comprehensible. People should actually know what the laws are and um, what happens if they break them. Um, offenses and punishments defined in advance. Um, this way, judges will be more impartial. There'll be more of a standardization, okay, when they're, you know, giving punishments for particular crimes. Um, and hopefully this would create people being treated more equally. People should have time and resources to prepare a defense. You know, before this, if you committed a crime, you know, you were taken straight to the judge and then a sentence was given. There was no time at all to investigate um, you know, challenges to the police's perspective. There was no time to prepare a defense, for example. So this is really the emergence of this idea. Um, punishment should be proportioned to the crime it should be more about deterring future crime rather than about revenge, and prevention is more important than punishment. And then also the really beginning of the argument against capital punishment and using torture to get confessions. So it would take a couple of hundred years before capital punishment was abolished in Europe. <clears throat> and then another influential text, like I say, Criminal Man by Lombroso, 1876. Someone, someone we're going to come back to in the course, but, <clears throat> you know, this is really beginning the nature-nurture debate, like I say, for 
Von Braun, so in his time, people were very much on the side that yes, it's biology. After he was quite discredited, it was a complete flip. It was all environment, nothing to do with biology. And now, after the you know, past couple of decades, since the you know, late 90s, we've kind of got to a space now in which we're valuing both, okay, both the environmental and biological contributions. <laughs> So maybe one question to ask is if we're looking at the impact of brain, the brain on behavior, which is really what neuropsychology is, um, are people actually persuaded by these sorts of arguments, okay, and these sorts of neuropsychological studies, you know, the general public jurors, um, are these actually something that people respond to? Um, well, in fact, the research would suggest that yes, this can be very persuasive, okay, in criminal trials, for example. People can be quite persuaded by neuropsychological evidence. But another question is, is that always a good thing? Okay, and probably the answer to that is it depends upon how the you know, research is being um, used and how it's being communicated to those who are listening. So one example of this is by Weisberg and colleagues in 2008. And what we have here is a good explanation given to participants. So one that a researcher might use and then a bad explanation, which is really a circle argument that doesn't actually explain anything. Okay, so participants are given either the good explanation or the bad one and asked how convincing the explanation is. Good news, those given the good explanation wrote it as being good, that it's, it's persuasive, but it's convincing. And those given the bad explanation rate it as bad, okay, that it's not convincing, it's not persuasive. So what happens if we add in some neuropsychological terminology? Okay, just to kind of you know boost the the image of the explanation. Well, no impact on the good explanation. Okay, with or without the neuropsych terminology, that still seems a good, convincing, persuasive explanation. But the bad explanation is suddenly seen as a good one, suddenly convincing, suddenly persuasive if this neuropsych terminology is used. Okay, so obviously there comes a responsibility. Okay, when one is in some sort of authority role perhaps when they're educating jurors or something such as this because if it's a topic like neuropsychology which jurors or members of the public feel as though they don't know much about you know they're willing to kind of listen okay to the authority figure who does know more about this sort of subject and it can add credibility you know even when it really shouldn't okay so it's something that should be used carefully with responsibility <clears throat> So neuroscientific evidence began being used in criminal trials in about the mid late 90s, okay, um, with Adrian Rain's work being the first. Um, but it's only became more and more common, okay, to include this sort of evidence in criminal trials. So one review between 2005 and 2012 there was about 15, 1600 cases across the US, okay, that used neuroscientific evidence in the defense's case. <clears throat> and this number is only increasing, increasing, okay? So in 2012, it was about 250, which was more than double the, num the number in 2007, okay? So we're actually at a point now where defense attorneys can actually get into some trouble if they don't um, even look at some neuroscientific um, possibilities, especially if it's a case in which the defendant is facing the death penalty, for example. And the defense should really be exploring every avenue okay, to help with the defense. <clears throat> About 5% of murder cases are using neuroscientific evidence, um, and about 25% of death penalty cases um, are using it. Now, the vast majority of these are unsuccessful, okay? So 72% of cases in which neuroscientific evidence is put forward, it's not convincing, it's not persuasive, it doesn't help the defendants. Okay. The bar to reach is high okay, when convincing the courts that the brain has led to faulty behavior, okay, or the faulty brain has led to faulty behavior, such as criminal behavior. And it should be a high bar. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that you know, more than nine out of 10 cases don't actually make it okay, to a trial. The vast majority of them are plea deals, right? Because a defendant will get a better sentence, you know, if they plead guilty 
rather than going to court and going to trial and then being found guilty, in which case they'll get a more severe sentence. So, you know, those that actually go to trial are the ones that are more murky. Okay, the one of which the ones which there is some scope for debates. Okay, otherwise the individual would likely have already pled guilty. But this sort of evidence can be persuasive, even for judges. So in this case, for example, um, the case of Ruiz, I believe he was he was seventeen and um, arrested for killing his mother. Um, and the defense argued that there was a brain dysfunction which impaired his executive functions, his IQ, his language ability, and so on. And because of all of this, he really wasn't competent to stand his trial. He did it because of these dysfunctions, wouldn't understand his Miranda rights, he wouldn't understand what he was entitled to, he wouldn't be able to um, you know, consciously and um, effectively help in his defense, he wouldn't really understand the legal proceedings. Okay? The jury were not convinced, and the jury found him competent, and the jury found him guilty. But in what's really quite a rarity, the judge set aside the jury's decision and said no reasonable person could have listened to this evidence and found the person competent, okay? because the evidence was that persuasive for the judge. And you know this isn't something that judges do lightly. They're not. They don't tend to put aside the jury's verdict. Okay, but they can do it in favor of the defense if they think the evidence hasn't been listened to. <clears throat> so, what issues might it be in which neuroscientific evidence is kind of coming into the argument? One is whether the person is competent to confess, for example. Um, so, in this case, we have two defendants. Um, I believe that they have been arrested for having marijuana on their um, on themselves, and um, one of the defendants, Thomas, um, argued that because of a brain dysfunction, he didn't really understand his Miranda rights, so his right to remain silent, his right to remain, his right to have a lawyer, and so when he confessed, okay, he wasn't competent to waive his Miranda rights, and so the, the confession therefore wasn't admissible, okay, because he didn't have the competency to understand what was being said. Um, indeed, there was neuroscientific evidence put forward, okay, that there was some brain dysfunction, and, you know, these areas of the brain are crucial for executive functions. Um, but the judge wasn't convinced when taking everything into account, okay? This was someone who held down a job, he worked at a gas station, he had been recently promoted to the manager of the gas station, okay? So, you know, this isn't someone who's completely impaired. This is someone who can hold down a job and even succeed in the workplace that he's in. Okay, so with that all in mind, the judge wasn't convinced by the neuroscientific evidence and declares he was competent, so he was found guilty. <clears throat> Another issue it might be relevant to is the debates over insanity. Okay, so, you know, for those who don't know, if you're found insane in a criminal trial, what that means is you can't be responsible for your actions for the crime that you committed because of this insanity. And so you don't go to prison and you aren't just released either. You go to a psychiatric hospital and you're held there until forensic psychologist or some evaluator determines that they're no longer a danger to themselves and they're no longer a danger to the public. Okay. So first of all, Proving insanity is very, very difficult. Okay, the bar is high, despite maybe what you've you know, seen in the media, so on. And jurors are far more likely to overestimate cases of faking, okay, than they are to um, um, un underestimate actual cases. Um, but also, in actual cases, if people are found to be insane and they're held in a psychiatric hospital, they're quite often they're held there longer than they actually would be in prison had they just been found guilty. But there is still a dis distaste, maybe, that's quite common in the general public over the insanity defense. That it means that some people are evading responsibility for crimes that they committed. So to kind of deal with this, some states have came up with a third option called guilty but mentally ill. So instead of you know finding the person guilty and responsible or insane, you can find them guilty, but yes, they're also mentally ill. In reality, 
this is no different than a guilty verdict came here. Still sentence to prison, the consequences are pretty much the same, whether they were found guilty or whether this whether this third um, verdict was, was rendered. <clears throat> Uh, and there's still some controversy over this. Okay, so in one case of Curtis, um, the judge found, or the judge decided, concluded that yes, the defendant is insane, the evidence is clear, but the judge didn't believe that there would be the resources in the psychiatric hospital to help this person. Okay, and so declaring them insane would be pointless according to the judge. So instead, he found the person guilty but mentally ill and sentenced them to prison. This was overturned by the appellate courts, okay? Because according to them, you know, the judge shouldn't be considering extraneous variables or you know outside issues when making this decision. The person is insane or not, okay? That's the issue put forward to the judge, okay? So that's what they should be considering, not some of these other issues that the judge in this case was looking at. <clears throat> And some other cases in which neural psych evidence could be put forward is to do with acting involuntarily, which would mean that, you know, if you act involuntarily, you're not responsible for your actions. Um, so in one case, for example, the defendant also has a, a, a arrest warrant out, and when the um, police confronted him, he decided to flee the scene. And then there was a police chase and then eventually he was caught. And he argued that he acted involuntarily, that he had a brain dysfunction from a previous accident in which a tree limb had fallen on his head. And because of this, he fled the scene without really having any control over his actions, okay? Um, but the judge looked at this, found that yes, there was brain trauma from this injury. There was evidence to back it up, but it happened some time ago. And when we look at what's happened in this person's life between the accident and the event in question, okay, it's not really relevant okay, because there's plenty of evidence in between that this person is competent, that they have good executive function, and that they um, are in, in control of their actions and their behavior. Um, another example to do with mental states, Gunther, um, arrested for killing his mother, beating her to death with a pipe argued because of a brain dysfunction he had that he acted really without thinking okay they got into an argument and then without thinking he picked up the pipe and hit her okay that it was involuntarily it wasn't um you know it wasn't premeditated it wasn't planned it was wasn't cold-blooded it was something that was in the heat of the moment something he couldn't control but one problem with this he'd been at the bar with his friends and told them over a beer how he was going to kill his mother and even asked some of them if they'd like to help okay so you know, that's not very congruent with his argument in court, okay? It's pretty good evidence that this was deliberate, okay? That he had the intention to kill, okay? So again, this wasn't found to be convincing to the judge and he was found um, guilty. <clears throat> now, 44% of neurobiological claims are about mitigating sentencing, okay? So what this means is the person would still be found guilty, they're still competent, they're still responsible for their actions. But because of this mitigating factor, they're given a less sentence than a typical person would be, okay? And usually what this is in the US is avoiding the death penalty and getting life in prison instead, okay? So usually the sentence is still pretty severe, but it's less severe than would be otherwise for someone who doesn't have the brain dysfunction or whatever it is that's um, an issue. <clears throat> And when it comes to determining mitigating circumstances, neuropsychological evidence can be persuasive even in pretty extreme cases, okay? So in this case, we have two defendants who kidnapped an 18-year-old girl, sexually assaulted her, pretty sadistically tortured her, okay, and then killed her. It's a very unpleasant graphic crime, okay, that would be very upsetting to anyone who hears the details. Um, but because of a brain dysfunction, it's argued that Ryan isn't as responsible for his behavior as the co-defendant because of a brain dysfunction. He's not as in control of his behavior. He's not as responsible as a mitigating circumstance. 
and the judge finds this convincing and Ryan is spared the death penalty given life in prison instead. Okay, so even in you know, pretty extreme cases, this can be persuasive evidence. But it can backfire too. So in one pretty similar case to the above case, the prosecution says this in their closing, closing argument. What are we left with? A doctor comes in and tells you, you couldn't help it. He was born that way. He was born evil, born bad. He's going to be that way from now on. There's nothing I can do except identify it. He's got a brain damage. He goes around raping women and beating them up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you decide how much mitigation that deserves. How much weight do you give that he does it just because he does it? Okay. So in this case, the jury found the prosecution to be pretty convincing and you know, they didn't buy into the mitigating circumstances and um, delivered the full maximum penalty. So like I say, it can go sometimes either way, okay? In some cases, jurors might think, well, because of this brain dysfunction, this person is even more of a danger. Okay? They're less in control of themselves, they can't be helped, um, and so that makes them even more um, dangerous and so should be locked up for an even longer prison sentence. <clears throat> Any questions on any of the cases I've just said there or anything else? So, you know, what we've seen there is quite a change, a progression, a shift in attitudes over crime. Um, and then a range of ways in which neuroscientific evidence is used in courtrooms today, in some cases in which it can be very persuasive. 